You're watching Fanboy Versus with your hosts, J.D. Church, Nicole Hale, Chris Triplett, and Chris McFeely. And you are watching Fanboy Versus. I am your host, J.D., joined this week by Nicole Hale and Chris McFeely. What's up? Chris Triplett's taking the week off. Uh, I'm semi sick, so I'm going to be drinking peppermint tea throughout the thrust of this show. So, cheers to that. <laughs> um, it is fanboy versus the long month at the end of the year, as uh, we have faced yet again a five week month and found ourselves short of comics, in particular, New 52. Mm hmm. Not, Not a, a damn one. one this week. So I was very happy. I went into my shop, and uh, they were actually having 20% off trades. That has been his uh, method nice. for dealing with the five-week month. So I picked up the first six issues in trade of Avengers Academy. So I'm Approved. checking up on that. <laughs> um, there's another reason that you may want to get caught up on Avengers Academy that we found out a bit about this week. We'll talk about in the news, which we might as well do now uh so chris what's up with academy yeah turns out i guess spoilers but not really sort of turns out striker's gay yeah um oh i didn't this know this to, yeah well yeah. uh it got uh axel alonso marvel's editor-in-chief just said it in passing in an interview yeah. on i believe it was comic book resources and everybody was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Hello? <laughs> you know, um, it's, it almost feels like he probably wasn't supposed to say it, but he said it, and they didn't try to put the genie back in the bottle or anything. So Christoph yeah. Gage did a, an interview with CBR about Striker, and we saw some preview pages from the next issue. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a thing that's happening. So that, that's good. It's, um, yeah, I approve of that. Yeah, so... I mean, there's thorny ground to tread over. Because, have, you, have you read that, um volume you have yet there? Jimmy? Um I've I skimmed over most of it and I read the um most of the striker centric issue that's in there. Yes, because there's some thorny ground there concerning his childhood and yeah, the I... activation of his powers and the, you know that could go off in a very bad direction. But based on the preview pages, um it's been very considered and uh in fact that's part of illustrating why he's actually completely normal. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, in Christus, I mean, you know, part of what he said was that this has been, like, the plan for the character pretty much all along. So it's not like, you know, we get concerned when these things come out and that they're, you know, shoehorning it in. And I guess some of the preview page shows him talking to um, um, Lightspeed. And, mm -hmm. you know, you get the feeling that they're starting to shoehorn in, you know, a lesbian characteristic for her. Oh, that's not you, Hart. I mean, that goes back to... Well, uh, okay, but it's not... I guess it's... Oh, well, yeah, obviously really... it wasn't when she was originally conceived, because she was originally conceived as a nine-year-old. As a nine-year-old, so, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so okay. runaways, like, years and years ago. Um, right. And feeding up them through the loser, loners, the loners miniseries that she starred in with the other characters. They were, they were a team, a superhero self-help group. Uh, called Excelsior that uh, debuted in the first arc of the second volume of Runaways, if I have my memories correct. So that's a good five or six years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, and then they went on to have a mini series of their own, called Loners, and um, it just they, they made some vague allusions toward it there. Like maybe she was a lesbian, maybe she was bisexual. Blah, blah, blah. So there, this seems to be great, just bringing that into the fold as well and using it as a springboard. <laughs> But um, but I think but the the indication is that that's been true for Stryker for a while. And one of the mm. things that he does mention is, of course, in that Stryker issue, and I just read it. You know, there's a scene in one in that issue where uh, I guess he's at the gym and he asks uh, finesse if she wants to have sex with him or whatever, and she turns him down pretty cold. And then he turns around and asks Vale as well. And then later, Vale sort of feels rejected by um, Justice. And she comes and basically says, well, hey, do you want to do it now? And he's like, oh, I'm tired. Let's talk instead. Mm. <laughs> and uh, definitely the hints are there. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. In particular. He, he, he obnoxiously, and it's a thing of strikers that he's 
an, an obnoxious loud guy who hits on everything that walks by but he, it's like he, he does it in deliberately the most obnoxious way so that they won't mm-hmm. take him on but how he but he appears to the other guys to be a manly man right and, it's, and it's very very clever I did once I read once I found those bits again with uh, with the abuse in his childhood mm-hmm. that it does yeah, so that's uh, it for gonna... the listeners who haven't read it. Like, yeah. uh, Stryker was um, abused by his uh, man. Stryker's mother is one of those um, uh, gold digging glory hounds who wants to live vicariously through her child. And uh, she was, he was, she, he was a child actor, if I recall right. Some, something like that at commercials yeah. or whatever it was. And um, he was, I believe, the touched inappropriately was the carefully chosen phrase to describe it and that's when his powers kicked in and he killed the guy so it wasn't an ongoing thing or something there was one thing that happened and his powers kicked in and the guy died as a consequence and striker is afraid that that made him gay you know and obviously there's there's the potential for that to go off in in a wrong direction if it wasn't being written by a less talented writer but the it's being used as a springboard to say you, know, you would have turned out that way even if that happened one thing can make you turn gay in fact that probably held you back from accepting that part of yourself for that much longer you know real good solid well considered yeah. stuff yeah so I'm, I'm looking forward to it i'm interested in see in the yeah, <clears throat> in that direction that that's going just another go. feather in the book's cap yeah mm. Um, did we miss it that Bunker debuted last week? Well, we probably tried to ignore it. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Fabulous! <laughs> uh, yeah. We didn't really talk about it. I hadn't heard much, but I thought we'd mention that anyway. So, um, other news. No, not the Titans were introducing a gay character. <laughs> right. Never, but that's Bob. <laughs> Mexican Latin man who dressed in purple with all the frills and the sunglasses. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, um, why, why did I mention that? <laughs> Alan's homosexual character, you know, yeah. th- just a little comparison. Um, so um, I, I'll mention this little bit of news. I know because we were going to talk about it as well. But um, so several years ago, this is how long like Superman movies have been in production hell and stuff. This was pre Superman Returns. Uh, Nicholas Cage was attached to a Superman movie mm-hmm. and uh he uh apparently as a part of of that and research for it decided he would get his hands on a action comics issue one and apparently there's <laughs> of him in costume right yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots, lots. Uh. <laughs> so apparently he's been hanging on to it all this time and just this week if he finally decided i guess he didn't decide to sell it but it went to auction this week and sold for uh, like two million dollars, crazy. Which, which makes it officially the highest selling uh, price for a comic it, ever. I mean, it makes you wonder if it if it if its price was has increased because Nicholas Cage was known to have touched it or something. I, I mean, there is that possibility. Or would it have sold for more if he hadn't? Yeah, like did that depreciate the value or increase? It? Hmm. Mm-hmm. But what, what was it just because of being attached to the film that he bought I, it? I think so. I think because I so. thought he was a huge Superman that, fan anyway. I mean, he's been hankering to play it. Um, I don't know. I, I to be honest, that's the way I heard the story from uh, NPR. So, and Chris is frozen, and I bet we lost him for a second. Oh no, Chris! Oh no, you guys! <laughs> um, so. So we'll would, you, time would, you, for... would you like to, to buy a comic for that amount of money? Right. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, God, I, I can't imagine. Uh, there's. <sighs> I love my comic books, but come on, get a reprint. <laughs> well, and see that. Well, that comes down. I mean, and that comes down to like the the different kinds of you know comic and comic collecting that there is. Mm-hmm. I mean, on one side of the fence. You know, you have people that purely enjoy it as a uh, as a literary medium, so to speak. You know, mm-hmm. that it's all about actually reading the comic, that it's about, you know, enjoying the story and all of those things. Um, but, you know, for some people, there is that collector's aspect to it. Mm-hmm. And I, guess I just haven't got into that. I just, yeah, that's, I mean, it's not for me right now. I just don't have the money to be that way. And that's not to say <laughs> I don't, like keep all of my comics and take care of them and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
you know, the, it, it is, it is, you know, in a sense where, as I try to save this for a second, <laughs> um, but you know, there is an aspect where I can, I can see the market for that. You know, I can mm -hmm. see that, um, you know, people would do that. And like I said, I take care of my comics, you know, I, I try to keep them in good shape and everything. So, uh, you know, so I can see the, the allure, I guess, of, uh, of that, but man, I just don't, I, uh, for something that I'm never going to touch, cause yeah, you no. couldn't, you couldn't even touch it. You just no. look at it. You know? It was just, it was just like, you remember that, that Simpsons where they bought the first, what was it? Adam man. What was it? And then they was like turning the pages with like tweezers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's totally that you thing. Know? I think like you've got to put on the special gloves and yeah, no, that know. doesn't sound like fun to me. Yeah. So, <laughs> Oh, no. Looks like Trax has joined us. I, I still think that he sold the big is because Nicholas Cage needed money. If you guys don't know, Nicholas Cage is notorious for spending more than he earns. So Well <laughs> Excuse me. And I mean, like I said, I think I think some of it too is just comes down to that um you know, he just didn't I you know, the part didn't come through. Like I said, I don't my new my information on that came from NPR, so uh and they I, maybe they had just put two and two together the reason he had it but they didn't really mention why he sold it so is chris mcfeely back with us well he posted in the chat yeah yes 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 he's, he's... back you missed all so, so what did, what did i miss uh nothing we were just we were we were, going on we were basically killing air so but yeah. basically yeah. just saying like i i mean i had heard from npr that he you know, had it because of the Superman role, so I don't know. Well, I think his son is named Jor-El, isn't he? It yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. So that's um, a big... But, I mean, uh, well, did he only name him it because he was once attached to the Superman? Yeah, I, I mean... he was a pretty huge Superman fan, anyway. Probably so. I mean, that happens to people. Well, let's crack on before I disappear so, again. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about the thing that everybody's talking about. Uh, Watchmen... Two or point well, one or whatever they're calling it. Well, Watchmen Two is just the name that they're sort of throwing around. It's probably not what it's going to be called or anything. No, no, no. Because it's not a sequel to Watchmen. Uh, no, no, no. First of all, none of this is confirmed right. at all. This is really just rumors out of Bleeding Cool. But uh, confirmed from various uh, anonymous sources, suggest that some kind of uh, Watchmen prequel miniseries focusing on characters or, or, or pairs of characters will be coming down the line at some time in the future. Uh, names attached into uh, Darwin Cook talking about a comedian miniseries and reportedly a Night Owl series with uh, Hollis Mason and um, Dan Draper Dan, yeah. uh, drawn by Andy Kubert and Joe Kubert. So that's, you know, sort of the father and son uh, thing. And um, there's been word of some involvement from Dave Gibbons, but potentially just like a, a Bleeding Cool describes it as a passive acquiescence. I mean, I don't want to. So yeah, I don't want to sound snobby, but it's kind of like I think the beauty of Watchmen is that it's 12 issues that gives you everything that you need. You know. Oh, certainly. I mean, it it you know it doesn't it's not all linear, which I think is part of the beauty of it as well. But it's 12 issues that gives you everything that you need. And I don't see the value in dipping back into that world. Monetary value. Other than, okay, I'm sorry. Mm. Other than <laughs> yeah, monetary. That's the only value. I don't see it. an artistic yep. or. Um, it's know, not as if there aren't years and years of room in the Watchmen story to tell tales where they'll fit in and, and without obstruction, but really contrary to the point of Watchmen. That kind of, that's, and I think that's what I'm saying. It's like mm. the, the point of Watchmen was to be sort of like this self, I mean, it certainly wasn't Alan Moore's original vision because, I mean, he was totally trying to steal characters from Charleston and ended up just having to, to make generic characters. Well, but I think that that made it. Their way, I, mean. you know, yeah. that's a diff I mean, it's like either way, it's still a story about the deconstruction of the superheroes in a Cold War era, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and that's why I say I think the fact that those characters exist in a self-contained universe, I think lent it more power than maybe he even realized it did because they weren't pre-existing characters that we knew anything about. You know, these were new characters that were created for this. All of the blanks that needed to be filled in were. And, uh, you know, you get a nice contained 12-issue story. Uh, other than fanfic stuff, I'm not sure what else you could really, you know, fill in. Just past adventures. Wasn't the Watchman movie tie-in video game a prequel? Um, I think so. I think it was supposed to be. I own it, and I will tell you that I have never <laughs> loaded it up. I bought it because it was the same price. the The deal that I got was the blue. It was the same price for the Blu-ray with the game as just the Blu-ray. So oh, I thought, uh-huh. what the hell? I'll just get the game, and I have never loaded it up. Definitely uh, some uh, high quality creators being reported as being involved, so they're not scraping the bottom of the barrel for people to work on this. But no, but it this... feels wrong headed anyway. Exactly. It just like it just feels like a money move to me, and that's just mm. that you know I don't. It... it seems like they're well. I guess that there's never a right time for it. No, but there's never a wrong time for it either, in the sense that Watchmen is timeless. Yeah. But you feel like if they were going to do it, they should have done it when the film was up. Right? They, they've totally missed the boat. I mean, you know, and yeah, the film didn't even do that well. It. So it's yeah. not like it has a lot of public appeal. I mean, Watchmen really only has comic appeal anyway, which I'm fine with. I mean, it, to me, it's a work of comic. And I think that, I mean, even people that I know that don't really read a lot of comics, including my wife, read the comic and really enjoyed it. So, you know. It has value outside of that. Oh, my, but... no, as a retailer, like, I've seen people who read the comic and loved it, read the comic and hated it, never saw the, never read the comic and loved it, never saw the comic and hated it, you know? That spanned the gamut. There was I, no... I like the never read the comic and hated it. That's... Yeah. <laughs> or, or never read the comic and loved it. That's, that's the... It's true, but funny. Um... <laughs> So I, I don't know. I think Gail Simone's jokes I thought were great when she was talking. Yes, about, <laughs> she was Little talking Watchmen. about doing. I almost missed it. She was doing. She was talking about doing she's like a little. She's writing Little Watchmen. Little Watchmen. Rorschach, Rorschach is just known as Blotchy. Oh God! <laughs> now that I would read. <laughs> Watchmen babies in V for Vacation. There's a there's a great video. I think you can get it on YouTube as well if you haven't seen it, which I'm sure most Saturday people have. Saturday morning Watchmen, which is the Saturday morning Watchmen, which yeah, is hilarious. Fantastic. It's uh, so good because it's so believable. Oh, I know. It's not only that, but it's just like perfect. Like to the stuff that's in the you know that's in the comic. It's just like oh, that's really just twisted like and true. A rock band and and comedians are biggest favorite and he's the, he's the the typical like leviscus character that was in every 1980s cartoon. Oh my every gosh. trope of 1980s cartoon television is is in in that one minute. Oh my god, it is so great. So anyway, um what you gonna do, Adrian? We're going to call <laughs> the Watchmen. Oh my god. I have to pull that out and watch it again just I haven't seen it in a few months it's always worth it <laughs> so anyway i don't know we'll see it's completely unconfirmed so we don't know anything yeah it's this probably moment. gonna happen though bleeding cool is not when they you have know, this level of it i i'm not. wondering i'm wondering sometimes if you know the comic industry doesn't do like politicians do because politicians will do this thing where they'll just like float a balloon you know they'll just like throw names out and just see like how the public reacts you know, like to candidates and stuff. I Com- wonder, comic books will then just do it anyway, regardless wonder, of what the reaction is. Well, but I wonder is. if sometimes they don't do that. Like, let's just throw a rumor out there that we're going to do a Watchmen and just see how people react, yeah. you know. And, let's see, you know, it's like with anything, it's like, let's see how much the internet hits this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's let's do it. All right. <laughs> let's go for it. <laughs> and we're going to claim to attach big name people and then we're going to replace them with unknowns right at the end. <laughs> Woohoo! <sighs> It'll be fantastic. They like that? All right, cancel it. Let's put JT Crow on it. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, you like these comics? All right, we're going to cancel them. No, um, no. You hate There's them? They're going to keep going. For Scott Lobdell. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, we're on a roll today. So, all right, well, I guess we'll get to reviews then. I don't know, is there yeah, any other news? Size of it. 
Yeah, I don't think there's any other movie news or anything other than... Well, there's this word about a Dark Knight prequel has been confirmed, which will be running in front of... Oh, yeah, the, uh, M- the Mission uh, Impossible. Mission Impossible 3, yes, in select IMAX theatres. I don't know yeah, what, the, the, what the, is ones, the, the ones that are actually filmed on film and not digital. Does prequel mean extended trailer? Probably, yeah. Okay. But not probably sure. like a little coherent... Couple more minutes, coherent a, than a trailer. It's like, not a bunch of scenes. I am not going to hold my breath that it's going to be more coherent. I'm just going to assume just, that it'll be connected at least. <laughs> just wait two days and you can find it on YouTube. Yeah. I thought I heard it was like eight minutes long or something. Really? That's, well, that's, I, thought, that's I, thought, I thought I heard that. Hang on, I'll look it up while you show it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's the... I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm getting so sick of having to hear news about... Dark Knight every week. It's like the movie's going to be ruined before we watch it. Oh, I know. And it, you know, there's no way it's going to live up to the hype. I mean, no. that, that was the beauty of The Dark Knight is that the first one was so, eh, it was okay. You know, and so then the second one came out and it was amazing. And then Chris mm-hmm. McFeely fell off the call. Again. And oh, Chris. <laughs> so I have a quick fix for that. Yay. No, I, I so just this think is why just... I do multiples of these. <laughs> I just think Things. there's just way too much talk about it. It's like they're force feeding you every bits of information, and then by the time it comes, be like, okay, wasn't as good as what I had in my head. Yeah. Well. Kind of like insert Transformer movie here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> see all these great clips, and then you then you see the movie, you're like, oh, wow. Well, I... what I had was a little bit better in my head. Yeah. Um, well, it's you know, sometimes results may vary. Um. Wow, now my side is uh, acting up a bit, so come on. Internet fail! Work, work thing. We are so sorry for the tech issues this week. Yeah. And the host issues this week. I'm like, rah, <laughs> digging my lungs. <laughs> well, anyway, I guess we'll get to reviews then. Yeah, and, might, as well uh, might as well start. If I can get this thing to work. Possibly. Come on. There we go. That's what I wanted it to do. Yay. Okay. We'll go with that for a second. It's okay. Just the two of us right now. It's just, just the two of us. <laughs> Can make it if we try. It looks weird because I'm not used to, to Skype looking like this. <laughs> I know, or it's like the full screen thing. It's a little creepy. Yeah, so, it's like, hi, Davey. <clears throat> hi. Nice Big <laughs> face of me. That's what everybody wants. That's like a wake-up call in the morning. All right, so what you got? Okay, well, I am going to review the one thing that I love more than anything this year in comic books, and that's the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number four. <laughs> da, da, da. Again, this comic has yet to fail me. Each month, I, it's better and better. Um, you get the inside of what was going on at April O'Neil's uh, lab that she works at what they were experimenting with, and you come across that they're trying to build a super soldier. Hence why the Foot Clan wanted to get a hold of it as well. Because can you imagine super soldier ninjas? Oh. I mean, <laughs> I imagine them all the time. And yeah, of it course. sounds great. <laughs> so let's just say there's a lot of people in trouble at her place because this got lost. <laughs> um, but that's just a little side story. The main story is... Um, Raph comes in contact with, with Old Hob. Old Hob is the cat that separated him from his brothers. Uh, he carried him off and was going to use him as food when Hob was a cat himself. Well, he got mixed up, and so he's mutant himself. So, But uh, Raph, as well as the other three turtles, they are forgetting their past at the, the plant where, or the, the lab, 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 laboratory. Sorry, I could speak <laughs> where they're at. That's very but... laboratory, <laughs> not lab- lavatory. Those are two different things. <laughs> That's why you say laboratory. <laughs> yes, there you go, laboratory. Laboratory. So... What are you doing in my laboratory, Didi? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a great show. Well, because Splinter was so more advanced, he he remembers what was going on there, and so he's trying to retrain the three that he has. Uh, to train their mind to get these memories back. Well, old Hob, he has a different way. He's like, I'm going to beat the memories out of you. Because he's like, I'm going to uh, 
teach you how, you know, because he lost his eye. He's like, I'm going to teach you what happened to me. And so guess what? It works. Raph, he gets, well, him and Casey get their butts pretty much whooped by old Hobbs gang. And it's working. Uh, Raph remembers who he was and what's going on. But like I said, uh, even though they're two great, you know, sold our warriors, they can't take on a whole gang themselves. But boom, boom, boom. Guess who finds them? Yes. Yay. The other three turtles find Raph and they're reunited. So, yay. <laughs> and let's just say there's a lot of ass kicking. Um, <laughs> uh, Old Hob gets a few stars in the arm, which is kind of nasty. <laughs> yeah, ninja stars. And, uh, but, the, so he runs off and the, the turtles are all reunited. And let me just tell you, the very last page of this made me want to cry. Nope. Uh, yeah, because they introduce Raph back to Splinter. And it's just the sweetest thing to see Splinter just light up with all this emotion. And, the, and it's a really cute group hug at the end. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so sweet. <laughs> They're all together again. <laughs> so, so, yes, it's very, very awesome. I love this. I, I, like I said, it's probably my favorite comic book this year. I'm loving it. I love each and every one. It's 32 pages, and it's very well worth every the four bucks I put out for it each month. Four dollars? Mm-hmm. Man. I know. It's I worth try it. try and get that in trade if, they, uh, I... if they're they able to publish it over here now after the yeah. investigation. Yeah, I, well, the, 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 the last one in, in this series uh, story is going to be next month, so the trade should be out oh, okay. for that because it's a five-parter starter series, so... And yeah, oh, it's, is it only a five issue miniseries? Or is it, well, no, no, no. It's just oh, the first. Just a five part, part arc, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, but no, they're going to be continuing in this. And uh, like I said, it's awesome. I love it, and I will buy the trade with it as well. So, that's good. Yeah. Nice. So, like I said, I about cried at the end. I'm like, I should be crying at comics. My gosh. Oh, I'm <laughs> crying. I cry reading comics all the time. It's. <laughs> But it, the, the ending was just, it was just nice. It was just so sweet. And of course, you can see how Raph gets kind of, kind of confused. He's like, wait, you know. And of course, Casey's confused. He thinks he, he got hit too hard. He's like, I'm seeing four of you now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's really good. If, I mean, even if, uh, if you're a fan of the Turtles, this is a must read. Even if you're not a fan of the Turtles, this will make you one. Nice. So, <laughs> there you go. Go awesome. read it. Love it. Cool. Um, you know, I opened up my Ghost Rider comic, and it was like I was teleported back to the 90s because there was this big ad for a cable written by Jeff Loeb. On... <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading Ghost Rider. It's like, whoa, dude, did I get... Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, it's 2011. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Great to God. Uh, Jeff Loeb. Anyway, um, so I obviously am going to be talking about Ghost Rider, something that has been canceled. Uh, so is this the last issue? No, I don't think so. Oh, I don't okay. Know, I don't know when it will be, though, because they've got the previews for the next issue, which features Hawkeye. What issue, what issue is that? This is issue six. I want to say I want to say I thought it was eight. Yeah, that sounds, that probably but is I'm not about sure. right. Considering, considering production and stuff, that sounds about right. So, um... <clears throat> So this issue, um, there's a couple of things that are going on as well as, I mean, a lot of these have ended up being very self-contained stories, which is disappointing and good, I guess. You know, in some sense, I'd like to have like a big overarching story, but on the other hand, considering it's going to be canceled, I hate to have loose ends. Mm. So um, there's discussion about, you know, the force of a hurricane and... There's, I guess, a hurricane that's coming to Louisiana, which is Zareth where Zarathos has drawn Alejandra, and uh, so she's sort of in like the uh, the swamps, and uh, there's an old woman guarding a what looks to be some sort of barrier, and then an island, and you walk on alligators, so it's kind of awesome. Um, nice. but, but when she crosses the barrier, like <laughs> when she crosses the barrier, she gets separated from Zarathos. Almost gets eaten by an alligator until some old guy pulls her up on the island. And there's a bunch of weird looking people on this island. And this guy, Earl, tells her that they, you know, had all been killers at one point, but they came here and were redeemed. And now they just live a peaceful life. And um, 
then from there it gets wacky because all the guys join into a big legion thing and try to kill her. A legion thing, huh? Yeah. Like, you know, imagine what a creature made out of 50 people would look like. Yeah. So, all sort of, like, mashed and glumped together. Um, and, because uh, what you find out is, basically, this old witch had been, had put up a, like, protection spell. And anybody that was a murderer was drawn to this island. And then they were told, well, if you kill someone, then you can leave. But they would hack each other to bits. And then the next morning, they would get up and everybody would be fine. So, it's like Groundhog Day. Oh. <laughs> but they wouldn't get to leave. And so they eventually just accepted their fate. But now they figured out since this girl is here, if they kill her, then they can leave. So that's why they're trying to kill Alejandra. Uh, but she manages to chase it outside of the barrier and then uh, lays some justice on them and burns them to fiery hell. Of which the nice. only... And, and it, I guess, kills off the old woman as well. So the only person left is Earl. And Earl had mentioned earlier in the story that he had, uh, the reason he was there is he had killed his whole family. And so he's like, okay, you know, we're free, I'm alive. And she's like, you murdered your family, Earl. And she fucking kills him. Hmm. But it's an interesting, and so, and then that's the end. Um, but it's an interesting story because it talks about, like, forces of nature and it links, like, the hurricane to that and talks about how Zarathos is much like a force of nature and she's just sort of letting Zarathos, you know, lead her on this path and maybe there really isn't maybe there's redemption, maybe there isn't, but there's just this you know, this this force um and that uh you know, you you maybe you can't escape your past. You know, you you'll have to face judgment. I think it's really interesting. I like the the themes that it's pulling on because I mean, again, you know, Ghost Rider being a sort of supernatural um, story, um, I like that it's going to, that when it plays on those elements of salvation, redemption, um, and also justice and punishment. And, um, you know, this this version of their Zarathos um, harkens back to some earlier versions, which, you know, I think, People like to think Ghost Rider is badass, but for a lot of like the Ghost Rider that I read, in particular like Dan Ketch and stuff, there was always like an element of like mercy. And this, th there's not as much mercy here. You know, there hasn't been that much mercy with this version of of Ghost Rider anyway. Um, you know, there's a lot of meeting out justice without any kind of. Well, Danny wasn't the host for Zarathos, was he? No, well, I guess not. Um, yeah, and that that My gets into a whole... knowledge is a blank something of a blank spot for me. But yeah, his was a. They tried to go into this different thing where his was a different thing where it was like a spirit that had been passed down or something. Yeah, it was an actual. It was a spirit of vengeance. Right. Yeah. And so, but that, that wasn't that the idea was that right that he was part of a bloodline, right? Cursed by Mephisto to always become the Ghost Rider, Mephisto's mm -hmm. agent, right? And turned out Johnny Cash and John Blaze were brothers, right? They'd been separated to protect them from the curse, but Danny was the one who was always going to fall victim to the curse. But Mephisto, in his devilish way, instead of he made it so that. Johnny would become a Ghost Rider yeah. and bound him to Zarathos to create that. But all of this has sort of become very muddled now. Yeah, it's not only that. Yeah, and it's one of those. Rider th equals Zarathos, and he's a spirit of vengeance. Apparently, Daniel Way decided Zarathos was actually an angel because he was a spirit of 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 vengeance and, and retribution, and not rage. Uh, even though Zarathos was. Not a spirit of vengeance, and that was Danny, and not, not Zarathos, not Johnny. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, um, and I think that it's better that that gets muddled and like forgotten about because I think the story, I think for the, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's it's that kind of baggage that when you come to Ghost Rider, you kind of go, eh? you know, it's like, I don't know, maybe that's just me. 
but uh, but yes, you are right. Danny's was not Zarathos. And the, the, the whole else. spirit of vengeance thing is good stuff, but you can't really link it to Zarathos without farting in the face of all of the history. Yeah. You look at the film where he just became Ghost Rider and they just left it at that, you know? They didn't bother talking about spirits possessing him or whatever. Well, that's well, more they, of a they second did, movie they, in any th- way. Yeah, it's called Spirit of Vengeance. Let's see what they do. Yeah. But I but anyway, but you know, it, even at that, getting back into, you know, more of a Zarathos centric, you know, comic, um, and and talking about the function and aspects of Zarathos, I think is interesting. Especially the Alejandras you know, a lot of times there was this battle between, especially be it Don, you know, Dan or Johnny, they were really battling Zarathos a lot. You know, it was a lot about struggling for control and struggling for dominance. And this is much more of a um, a symbiotic relationship that Alejandra is really trying to not necessarily follow Zarathos completely, but see where it, you know it's like she's seeing where it goes you know she's really trying to let it work out let it try and feel its way out i mean this is i mean in something like this character spent her whole life being raised to be ghost rider which is something really different i mean we've seen johnny who and johnny and both johnny and dan sort of came upon it you know fish out of water out of nowhere but she was really raised to become ghost rider and so she's taught, she's got a very different approach to it. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that she's got full control of her powers and that she really knows what she's in for, but it, it's, it's certainly a different approach than I've seen. And, and it's, it's letting the comic go into some interesting directions for the next two issues. But, but anyway, I, I like it. I mean, so far I've, I, I've enjoyed it and I think that, I, I wish it would get more of an opportunity to grow. I think it's growing with each issue. <coughs> Obviously, it's not, so I can just go home and cry in my Wheaties. <laughs> but um, but anyway, I think it's good. I think it's worth a read. Check it out. I mean, like I said, your mileage may vary, but I'm at least enjoying it. So, sorry. It's sad that you're enjoying it and you know it's getting canceled. I know, isn't it? Doesn't that yeah, suck? I'm thankful that there is not a single book yet that that's happened to for me. Well, lately. I mean, I'm... Yeah. Lately. Hurt, yeah, well, I mean... Hurt got I mean, canceled. I mean, I lost Victor Von Doom and Destroyers, but that was before they came out, so I didn't... You you were reading Hurt for a while. I didn't, I didn't get a, a taste. Yeah, but I was going to drop Hurt, and then I decided I'd just stick it out to the end. Um, and you've had that happen before, though. I mean, you know that that's happened to other stuff you've read, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Surely, <laughs> he's really trying to think I'm about. I'm thinking, it. but um, well, Runaways. Yeah, that wasn't Secret officially cancelled, though. That was just Secret Six. <laughs> yeah, 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 Secret in a way, Six. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is it's kind hard, of feeling it, that it's way. It's kind of hard to think of that as cancelled, but because it's the it circumstances. Was, though. I mean, you it's kind of hard yeah, not to think of it that way yeah. now, though. I, I'm just thinking of things that like had the legs cut out from under them because they weren't doing well, you know, where Secret Six was cancelled for other yeah. more wide reasons. The, the the only example I can really think of is John Oster under Heroes for Hire from the late 90s that jumps out at me as something that I was like, ah, fuck. I was yeah. annoyed that that was cancelled out from under me. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think of a major example. Uh, yeah, there you go. Hmm. So anyway, all right. Well, I'm I'm sorry, JD. That's it's it's funny. okay. No one else is reading it, so <laughs> yes, you're um, the one guy. In general, I mean, no <laughs> one else is reading it, like me, <laughs> and like five other people. You know, well, I, I when I first heard about them getting a new Ghost Rider, especially being a female one, I kind of wanted to read it, and then I, for some reason, I just totally forgot about it. So <laughs> yeah, but everybody else. Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like Marvel spent a lot of press on this, you know. So. That's probably the reason, because I didn't see a whole lot of advertising for it. But I think, and we talked about it, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and I think I think you're right, Chris. I think it's just, you know, there really isn't an audience for it, you know, Ghost Riders. Well, of... I would also say it definitely got lost in the fear itself shovel. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't sad. generally tend to do the thing and go, oh, a crossover's killed that, however, like some people are doing that for Herc. I don't really buy that. Herc didn't start out with a crossover. It actively wanted to be part of Spider Island, and it really didn't tie in with Fear Itself very tightly at all, but Ghost Rider launched with Fear Itself, and there was just so much Fear Itself stuff. I think Ghost Rider did get lost in that. She's, young enough. 
She ought to go to the academy. That would be... Well, you never know. That would be kind of fun. Zarathos and Avengers Academy? (laughs) (laughs) That could be bad. Lots of people with evil pasts, and she's sort of (laughs) vengeance. and Yeah, that would be bad. Never mind. Don't do that. No. So, anyway. All right. Chris, on to you, sir. Okay, well, I just didn't really read anything that was particularly world setty on Fiery this week. You know, I gave, uh, I picked up the Avengers Origin Store one shot because it's written by Catherine Immerman, and it's okay. It's nothing, nothing too special. Ultimates continues to be entertaining. The last issue of her came out and just sort of reminded me why I was dropping it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Red Skull Incarnate, uh, the final issue of the Red Skull miniseries, which we talked about the first issue back when it came out a couple of months ago, I haven't talked about it again since. That's wrapped up this week and continues to be just as nasty and as un- unpleasant as the first one was. We'll talk about a few of the other things I have um, later on at the end of the show, but uh, Daredevil by way, it also continues to be really great. Really great use of the comic medium in this one again, just as with Marcos Martin. There's a really great page turn moment in this where you think one thing is going to happen and then you turn it and it's a double page splash. It's something else entirely. Oh. Very good. But uh, yeah, so what I'm actually going to talk about is uh, I read two graphic novels this morning. And they were good. Wow. I'm going to talk about them. Yeah. The first one is Fantastic Four, One, Two, Three, Four, which is by Grant Morrison and Jim Lee. This is not new. Uh, the original Fantastic Four, One, Two, Three, Four miniseries came out in checking the end this year, 2001 across 2001, 2002. So good long time ago, back when Marvel had Morrison. And it is a four-issue uh, deconstruction of the Fantastic Four. It's a hot and humid a couple of days in New York City. The Fantastic Four are on edge. There's no villains about. Nothing's going on. And that uh, Reed Richards has himself locked up in his in-deep thought, do not disturb room. The thing's losing his temper. The Human Torch is bored and Sue Storm's feeling ignored. And that's when Doctor Doom strikes. I thought that every issue was going to be something of an examination of one member of the four each, but uh, besides a very thing-centric first issue, and uh, maybe like the Invisible Woman's the subject of about half the second issue, um, it isn't really. Um, but the basic idea is that Doom preys upon the individual feelings character feelings and personality feelings of the members of the four to take them out one at a time. He uh, entices the thing with the possibility of a cure and sends him through his time machine in order to turn him back into the human he was before, but all his memories go with it. You know, He recruits Namor to seduce the invisible woman when she's at her emotionally weakest. The mole man is promised Alicia Masters if he can take the human torch away and trap him in the dank caverns of the earth where his flame will gutter and die and all the while mr fantastic's locked away thinking but uh without dropping any major spoilers as to the plot it's kind of like i mean i basically decided to read it because it was morrison and i didn't used to have a great appreciation of morrison but i've developed it over like the last year or so when i had that revelatory moment of understanding regarding his batman and the genuine quality of his action comics This is kind of for Fantastic Four, like what All-Star Superman was for Superman. It, um, you know, it takes as its starting place a study of the Fantastic Four's failings, which was the, the, uh, there is their defining factor. You know, that's what made the Fantastic Four great. That's what made them different from uh, superheroes of their times. That's what made the Marvel Universe stand out when it was born. It was these heroes who had problems and fought amongst each other and were like real people. Uh, and so the idea is that Doctor Doom preys upon those. And he does so by bringing out like the top three Fantastic Four baddies of all time, really. Doctor Doom, the Submariner, even though the Submariner is not really a bad guy anymore, but you know when he's doing a sort of showcase everybody you got to have the Submariner in there. These are like some of their earliest villains from the first four issues of Fantastic Four. Take away the Skrulls and the Miracle Man, and you have the villains from the first five issues of Fantastic Four here. But the central uh, conceit of the climax really is that while those character flaws were what made them stand out originally, they are more than their flaws. The true, the strength of the Fantastic Four and what makes the Fantastic Four great is their ability to overcome those flaws. And this is what a small and petty man like Doom fails to 
every hand, and this is why his plan fails, you know. I mean, it also involves a giant doom robot attacking the Baxter Bell tank, so you can't really go wrong there. But it takes these um, these strong character-based ideas, and it also blends them with Morrison's higher and increasingly higher and higher level concepts, where um, you know, Reed uh, realizes Doctor Doom gets a hold of a machine that allows him to essentially rewrite. Um, not reality so much, but to move people around reality as if on a chessboard and allow all of these things to happen in accordance with his vision, to and the the belief that he can play these characters using their feelings. Whereas Reed uh, senses it happening and locks himself away to think of a solution, and he uh, he realizes that all he has to do is stretch his consciousness and grow new brain structures in order to outplay Doctor Doom. So you know it's two higher level consciousnesses battling on a different playing field by the end of the thing. But as I say, the, the real heart of it is that the Fantastic Four are more than their weaknesses. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a real celebration in a dark way. Because it's, it's uh, art by Jay Lee on this, so I suppose listeners of this show will probably know best as the artist for Dreamwave's World War II Transformers G.I. Joe crossover. Marvel readers will probably know him best as an artist on Submariner in the 90s. So it is quite um, a, a shadowy, um, dark, heavily inked storyline, you know. But as well, you know, it's, it's the Fantastic Four. As I said, they're more than their weaknesses, and they are a unit together. It, you know, uh, the Fantastic Four. It's just you know, everybody always calls them the first family, and and they are you know because they are a family, they're a unit. It's what makes it's a study of what makes the Fantastic Four unique. They're not the Avengers, they're not the X Men, you know, they're not the two other big teams in the Marvel Universe. Members can't come and go and change. There have been times when Luke had just stepped in or the Shield has stepped in or Crystal and Medusa may have swapped in briefly, but it always comes back to the four. They can't change. They are a unit and together they are more than themselves and it's a celebration of that fact and Reed sums it up here my family are an equation alter one part of the equation and it no longer tells the truth we're a beautiful perfect emotional molecule turning in mathematical space <laughs> is the most wow. is the <laughs> most beautiful way Reed can find and you know when Reed is saying describing his family as perfect maths you know that's that's the only way Reed can actually express his true love and understanding of the people around him and it, you know, it's just um, it's just a, a glorification of that and a a defiance of the bitterness and the solitude that Doctor Doom represents. A man who has shut himself away from reality and tries to manipulate people versus a team of people who are truly, you know, one unit together, inseparable. And um, it's it, it is to the Fantastic Four what All Star Superman was to Superman, as far as I'm concerned, and recommended reading. Also contains, um, as a sort of backup strip, uh, a short Nick Fury story, which has nothing else to do with anything that's in there, but which is purely included because it was the only other short Marvel Knights story that Grant Morrison wrote. This sounds like a really good starter series for someone who no, doesn't know. I'm not 100% sure. Like, like I say with... <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, with All-Star Superman. I don't know if I recommend All-Star Superman to somebody who's just looking to start out on Superman. In the same but everyone way I... knows... The thing is, everyone knows Superman. Everyone knows his story. Well, yeah, but everybody knows the basic tenets of Superman. I don't think a lot of people today who understand that have an appreciation for the wacky Silver Age space-faring Superman. But we talked about this when we reviewed the All-Star Superman cartoon earlier this year. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there that'll come off as very strange to um to somebody who doesn't really know that that was a that was a Superman thing, you know? Um and well, you know, Fantastic Four plays it is doesn't go nearly as far, you know, there's really only one high concept crazy Imaginati explorer type thing in this. Um, I'm still not sure that it's a great intro to the Fantastic Four. Um, uh, it's yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But you know, if anybody has any passing, I, I but uh, at the same time, like it doesn't require any particularly um, in-depth knowledge or or understanding of the strange foibles of their long history, the way I think All Star Superman sometimes does. Um, if you have knowledge of the Fantastic Four. Be it, it goes maybe beyond the films. I think anybody can pretty much read that, and I would recommend that they do. How much does that? How much does that cost? That is a hardback, uh, and it oh, is okay. twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. Uh, it wasn't you know, available in paperback. Got... 
Yeah, it was only four issues, but it's not too bad for a hardback, as you say. Uh, plus, it's got the Nick Fury story in there. Um, it was available in paperback a couple of years ago, but it's been out of print for a while, so they brought it out as a nice hardback now that um, Grant Morrison's stock is up, basically, I yeah. think. <laughs> and, it was hardback. <laughs> and the other thing I read this morning as well, which I've been looking forward to reading for a while, is a book that's called Gingerbread Girl by Paul Tobin and Colleen Coover. This is published by Top Shelf Productions. Oh, so this Collect- isn't the Stephen King one, huh? No, this is something else I didn't know until recently <laughs> that I learned. Gingerbread yeah, Gingerbread Girl. Um, this was originally serialized online, so I think you can find it online to read um, if you want to, and I would, I would recommend it, as we will now talk about. But the paperback's only twelve ninety five, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, longer than, it's longer than FF, you know, so. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book I picked up basically because I have... Always, it's written by Paul Tobin, and it's uh, art by Colleen Coover. And that's two creators whose works I've always liked what little I've seen of and have wanted to read more by them. Paul Tobin uh, wrote a lot of Marvel's uh, adventures, all ages stuff. And I guess most widespread, most recently, he'd be known as the guy who was doing Spider-Girl. And Colleen Coover, I couldn't really point to any one thing she's done consistently. She just sort of pops up here and there. She did sections in girl comics. Um, she did backup strips in X-Men First Class for a long time. But she has a, a very sort of, a very uh, simplified, uh, kinetic, uh, almost archy sort of style uh, n- uh, newspaper strip look to it. But don't let that belie the innocence, you know, because she's also known for drawing erotic comics. It's not, you know, the, the, the innocence of the artwork in this belies a lot of the emotional content. Um, there's no better way to sum up the plot than just by reading off the back of the book, so I'll, I'll just do that right now. Ah-ha-ham! Narrator voice is coming up. <laughs> there are a myriad of verifiable facts concerning 26-year-old Anna Billups. She likes sushi and mountains and piglets, but hates paper cuts and beer breath. She flirts with girls and boys and loves to travel. She might have a missing sister, or... She might be totally insane. Did Anna invent an imaginary sister named Ginger during her parents' traumatic divorce? Or did her mad scientist father extract part of her brain and transform it into a living twin? In this whimsical, thought-provoking graphic novel, the host of narrators, including boyfriends, girlfriends, neighbors, bystanders, magicians, and passing animals, try their best to unlock the mystery of Anna and the gingerbread girl. <laughs> Right. Um, yes, um, because it's a total fourth wall breaker. It is narrated um, by everybody from the central figure, Anna herself, at the very start, through um, her lovers, uh, people she walks past on the street, people who decide to insert themselves into the narrative for the purposes of speeding the narrative along or uh, to explain some of the scientific concepts behind it. And on, on two separate occasions, a pigeon. Um, picks up the narrative because the characters leave one area and the pigeon has to fly across town to get you, the reader, to where the characters have moved themselves to so that the story can follow on. A bulldog also takes up the narrative at one point. British bulldog. Good evening. First, before I begin, a question. (laughs) It's just a bulldog saunters across town and leads you back to the characters. Um, But it's not... Hmm. It's, it's, it's rather hard to describe without going into it in too much detail, which I simply don't want to. But Anna believes and tells uh, everybody that her father was a mad scientist who extracted what is called the <clears throat> Penfield homunculus from her brain, which is a real <laughs> life, uh, it is actually a real life part of your brain, the part of your brain that registers touch, sensation, the sensation and touch. Um, uh, and somehow in his lab transformed it into a twin sister uh, for her who feels what she feels. And that twin sister is now missing and lost to the world. But she, it's set in Portland, Oregon, and uh, uh, Anna believes Ginger is somewhere in Portland and would like to find her. Um, now, it is uh, perhaps no coincidence that at exactly the time that Anna claims this happened, that her parents had a violent and messy divorce. So the question is, did she just invent a sister on which to, uh, which she could believe that, well, she, on which she could project all her feelings and believe they were happening to somebody else, or did this 
really happen. You know, we get third person accounts from the various characters who carry the narrative. Primarily, um, her her girlfriend uh, Chili and uh, her boyfriend Jerry. She's bisexual, uh, but she doesn't like the label because uh, culture, uh, modern culture, reflects poorly upon it. Um, and the storyline just follows the narrative of her and Chili out on a date from art galleries, walking through the streets to shops, as all these little facts are given, and random characters that they pass on the street are people who feel the need to explain some of the crazy things that she is saying, you know. And she resents being referred to as crazy, so it leads to some confrontations. And um, for all of the wild ideas that are in it, it is a very... As I say, the innocence of the art like belies the emotional content of some of the things. And I can't go too deep into what actually happens in it because it just ruins it for the climax, you know, so I, I can't I can't tell you too much. But um it is a book about accepting who you are and other people being willing to accept that aspect of you. It throws you a couple of curveballs. There's a couple you know, where where um you know, I uh, Anna trips up a cashier to stop to prevent her from uh, stopping a, a shoplifter. And I figure she's done it for one reason because of what we've seen on previous pages, you know. But it's actually another reason entirely that's far more introverted that I didn't uh, didn't expect to be the reason. And it, it uh, it's a book that just sort of makes you think, as as it describes it, it's, it's whimsical and thought provoking. And there's no other description I can give for it that is as solid as that one. Um, it's unusual. And if you're going into it expecting a solid mystery with a beginning, middle, and an end, that's not what you're going to get. I must caution you of that. And it is not designed to, pro to write a, a concise tale that will solve all the mysteries of life and dealing with the problems of your past and your emotional coping mechanisms. It's just a story about one night in one person's life who has these issues and um, how she and the people around her deal with them and react to her. And it's called Gingerbread Girl, and I would strongly recommend it to anybody. Nice. How much is that? Nice. That is only twelve ninety five. That's not bad. But as I say, I mean, yeah. it, support it, buy it, absolutely recommend it. It's an odd shape. You know, it's about as wide as an ordinary graphic novel, but oh, um, okay. two-thirds as tall. It's kind of little pockets. Not Sweet. pockets. Sweet. But... You I'll need have to, to see if but, they have you know, it. You, you can read it online. So I think I think <laughs> it's probably still up online wherever it was that it was originally serialized, and you can read it there if you want to. But I recommend buying it. Nice. It's really nice. To, I mean, I don't know how this. I can't imagine this would have um, read nearly as well in page by. I don't know if it was page by page or a couple of pages ago or whatever. But just getting to sit down and read this from start to finish in one chunk um, was. Uh, I think I can only. It would be a superior reading experience as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, there's just some, some you know, stories that work better graphic novel wise <laughs> than story by story. Mm -hmm. Yep. The other graphic novel I read this week was uh, Ozma of Oz, and that's uh, the, one of Marvel's Oz books. And again, they are one that I always think reads best in um, graphic novel formats. So I've sat down for a couple of hours yeah, you, with that. You were on something else talking about that. Uh, yeah, was oh, I you were on Underbase. Yeah, underbase. you were on Underbase yeah. talking about that. Yeah, I always like, recommend no. all Oz books. Sweet. I really wanted to jump on that one, too. <clears throat> well, there's another eight-issue miniseries. The first three volumes of the Oz series are out now. The fourth one's currently being serialized. Nice. Read them. Recommend them. Sweet. Okay. This week. So, uh, that brings us to our, what I'm hoping will be a two-part feature for the end of the show. Because <laughs> it's um, also random. Because it's so <laughs> random. Because week. we, us three never, none of us read the same No crossover. <laughs> I literally had two comics yeah. and a trade I bought this week. So, yeah. Uh, so, let's start with uh, first... Tiny Titans then. Tiny Titans. Tiny Titans. This is a. <laughs> this was so fun. <laughs> you know you were off to a good start when the first page, like the the pre-issue one panel cast page, has Robin, Beast Boy, and Cyborg looking up at the mysterious woman from the New Fifty Two. She walks mm -hmm. by and goes, "Who's the lady in purple? I have no clue, but I hope she's not in my continuity." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the thing is, she she makes her make she makes her way many times throughout. Oh, so it's the funniest comic. that she just saunters by in the background, and all the cast stop. she's her like turn. practically right there well, in the front. Everything. Sometimes it's the background, sometimes it's the foreground, but she just walks through a panel. Everybody stops what they're doing and goes, like, uh, "Who's that?" Press marks hanging up <laughs> their head, and then just go right back to whatever it was they were doing. 
Oh, why did I not buy this? <laughs> we always the thing is, we have... I, we're not going to blow on this show no, because DC has reported it, it as news. <laughs> yeah, we find out it was under the cape. Now, DC, DC reported and I give Tiny Titans a bigger push in the news this week because uh -huh. of this fact. So we're not going to blow Oh, it they here. reveal it? Yeah, yeah, the cape comes off. Wonder Girl gets her in her jump rope. Ooh. Well, you have to tell me after the show then. I'll tell you after the show. <laughs> But the, um, the actual story of the issue is about how Robin is heading off on a mission with Batman, and um, uh, he's got a replacement coming in. But Talon, who's the evil Robin from a parallel universe from like a couple of issues back where everybody dresses in bad purple and green colors, awesome. except he wears red and gray, is insistent that he should get to be the replacement. And it turns out that his replacement is the Protector. And that's a name that's going to mean nothing to nobody, but the Protector yeah. was a a replacement character for Robin created for a Teen Titans anti-drug PSA comic because Robin was tied up in licensing with Super Friends at the time. Oh, I didn't know wow. that. Wow. I just thought they totally made him up. <laughs> oh, that's even cooler. You know? And yeah. so the continuity is flowing rich and fast in this issue, very deliberately, since continuity now, wait, is a I've got a thing. question for you, McFeely, since you, you know about the Protector. Is he really the sidekick to the hot dog vendor? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Because they, they want to know who his, who's, he's a sidekick to, because they're like, well, Robin's a sidekick, you're not a sidekick. He's like, yeah, yeah, but he pulls out a picture of a hot dog vendor. <laughs> he's not a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. Is hot dogs rock? <laughs> <laughs> and then Cyborg even makes reference back to the Teen Titans little Archie where he won a burger eating contest with Jughead. Oh my god. <laughs> so Talon tries to get... Um, go, Talon goes to the bat cave and tries to get the bats and penguins who are all living there to kick <laughs> the protector out because they're worthy. He tricks them into thinking Robin's going to take their place. Take his place. <laughs> and then the final part is about... Um, revealing the identity of the mysterious purple woman so we can't Wait. talk too deeply about that but continuity is is the, is the game like uh, talon thinks that the protector might be robin because they have exactly the same hair you know, stuff. Uh, that, and that's I, also another the, really good ending that that with him at the end there too. Yeah, it wasn't the ending of that one either yeah so we can't really say too much more than that because it you know whenever the cape comes off i laugh like a dream oh yeah uh, let, you know, let's be honest. Well, well, it's not spoiler to say it, but like this is not going to be true for the mainstream DC. No, yeah. but it's fun to know that that you know they're playing along with the the DC fifty two. So, yeah. <laughs> but the best it's... thing is they're able to do this and make it funny without oh, yeah. little children requiring to have read that Teen Titans anti drug thing or to even know who the Purple Woman is because the the first page is like, who's that? I don't know. And then she drifts by like three times in the course yeah. of the film. Everybody just goes, uh? so the gag is entirely self-contained as well. But is it also at the same time it uh, it does call back to like a bunch of issues ago in Tiny Titans when the concept of continuity came up before, and they they were teaching kids what continuity was, and Cyborg had to get a lesson in continuity. Oh my <laughs> and god. <how> <laughs> And then it all factors back into this one as well. So we haven't talked about Tiny Titans on the show for a yeah. while, but that is one of the funniest it, issues of Tiny Titans in a while. It, it was it was very well worth the read to, to just to see who is underneath. The... <laughs> <laughs> Go out and yes. buy it, even if you don't normally. This one is one that that if, will probably appeal. <laughs> yeah, if you if you are you know a DC fan, this is a must, especially if you got into the whole new DC Fifty Two. Yeah, you gotta get this one just so <laughs> you can laugh at the rest. Of if you're us. really looking some, for something, you know, if you're somebody who's just got back into comics off the back of the new 52, or if you ventured over to DC and you're having trouble finding something that you'd like to give your kids, um, because, well, new 52, mm, um, this is the book to look to. Oh, the thing is, this is as fun for adults as it is kids, though. Let you, How uh, can you not of, find yourself laughing once or twice? I've been saying it for like two years now, but if there's joy in your heart, there's no way you could not. Well, the thing <laughs> like is, it's that. actually this show and your reviews of Tiny Titans that actually made me pick this up. And I'm like, why was I reading this before? So. I like to feel I've touched people emotionally. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, <laughs> all right. Touches... <laughs> Many people, Sweet. far and wide. I should Here, read that. I, I, I'm tweeting that. Maybe I should replace <laughs> Ghost Rider with Tiny Titans. And is it... Oh, there you go. <sighs> yeah, there you go. You got a gap in your uh, in your thing now. Right. Gap, yeah. A gap in my thing. Your pool. A gap in your pool. A gap in my pool. Right. That's a, yeah. Anyway. Um, so. <laughs> Make it dirty. It's not. No. <laughs> it was funnier that way. Um, <laughs> anyway. So. Uh, FF is still around. Yeah. This will just be our second half. So this will be the second half of our two-part sort of review where Chris has read things that I <laughs> that nobody had only one other person <laughs> has. Only one other person has that we might talk about. So um yeah. Wow new art. I the yeah, the art on this is by Juan Bobilo, who uh, I think people are really gonna know as the artist of She Hulk under Down Slot. Oh, okay. Yes, he was the artist for the first volume, uh, Shared Duties with Paul Pelletier, and he did bits of the second volume as well. And uh, I developed a real appreciation for his art when he was on. I'd never seen him before, but I really came to associate his art um, very much with She-Hulk. Um, he drew a very good sort of cartoony, sexy sort of She-Hulk. It was just really the right sort of way, cartoonish sort of sexy, fun style that, like, not sexy, like, sexy, but, like, Sexy, like a cartoon, but right. not like a cartoon. <laughs> it's it's really hard to describe. You know, she had all the right bumps in all the right places. But <laughs> uh, you know what? This is just coming after, after you just admitted that you like to touch people. She has the bumps in the right places. <laughs> right. Oh, Lee, you are awesome this week. Wow. <laughs> I am not on my game. <laughs> or um. <not> my. <laughs> So I, I the so uh, talking about that first though it's not I guess having read um, you know so much in like the previous style this is really a style departure oh yeah. um, you know funny even, thing is that FF hasn't really even managed a consistent artist over its first year I mean Steve Epting is supposed to be the dude and he did like the first arc but Barry Kitson did a big chunk of the of the second half of the year um, but he's quite close to Steve Epting like. Uh, um, Stylistically, right. I and mean, you could tell them apart, but this this, this follow the same like basic realistic style, and um, this is uh, much more cartoony. Yes, but not I bad, and I'm not saying not it's bad. Um, before we get too far, is there color issues? Did I was there a few color issues I noticed? I feel like maybe um, like maybe some hairs were like well, this first page you, you're probably really looking at this first panel of the kids, aren't you? Because there is like one tall kid too many and i don't see leech well that's what i'm saying is color problems is because if you look in the back there's a I little think, guy he's i think that's supposed to be leech standing next to franklin and he's pink but is that no franklin's in the front you know but that's so you, a whole no that's what i'm saying is another issue the other three tall humans should be alex val and bentley right but there are four tall people here so one right. of them is presumably supposed to be leech uh, or or Artie, and then the little guy is supposed to be Leech or Artie. Either uh, way, that's yeah. supposed to be Leech, that's and he's just purple. a coloring issue, though. That's mm. yeah. There's uh, well, that's an issue issue too. But I think that I think that's supposed to be Leech, and the colors are. But that pops up again. Um, I didn't catch it again, though. To be fair. Well, there's like two leeches, I think. You sure you're not looking at the fish people now? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, let me get to the page. That I'm thinking of, because it's near the back, I think. Yes. Okay. The page where um, it's the panels at the top, and mm. there's uh, the dragon, and then the kids, mm -hmm. and um, Nathaniel's on the far right. Yeah. Who's the pink thing? That's Artie. 
Okay, I don't know who. Why do I not know who Artie is? I don't know. You're not paying attention, obviously. Apparently not. <laughs> Artie's, the, Artie's the one who casts holograms, but he lost his powers in M Day, so he's been casting holograms with a with a helmet. Oh, okay, that's why. Yeah. It's the art style that's throwing me off too. Yeah, I mean, it's a different art style, and there's definitely, you know, there's one or two. Definitely that first group shot. There's a cock up in there somewhere. Um, and him and Leech are drawn a lot alike, which is what's throwing. They, me they off are too. very physically alike, though. That's not really an artist. So you know, somebody's missing. So th there's well, a tall person has been substituted into this panel in place of Leech. I'll put it this way. The the change in art style has changed their look, and that has confused me. It's not that they don't look alike. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I, I'm the the change in art style has confused me. But yes, anyway. Just that, and yes, moving on. Anyway. Moving on. That's that terribly uninteresting. Yes. <laughs> Terribly boring to talk about. Not visual medium. <laughs> Let's talk about the story, as it were. Not as it were, as it good. So go ahead. I'll let you. Indeed. Oh well. Uh, following on from the events of uh, Fantastic Four number six hundred, Valeria has teleported. I'm sorry, translocated the top three floors Important of the Baxter detail. Building. To, <laughs> yes, uh, as she says, uh, into a snowy mountain somewhere, and it turns out, hey, they're at Uncle Doom's. So they just track across the Balkans. <laughs> And uh, to Latveria, where um, Christoph and Doom and the shackled Doom, that is, and the last remaining Reed Richards duplicate and Nathaniel are all gathered together following recent events in FF. And, uh, you know, that's sort of about it as far as we want to go into details. You know, this is very much about putting the ducks in a row for this final storyline, uh, All Hope Lies in Doom. They get some flashbacks to whenever Valeria and uh, Nathaniel were scheming together in the past. We see Valeria building a lightsaber for Bantley, you know. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and that's a particular thing that I want to talk about. We last we mentioned out of um, Fantastic Four 600 that the, you know, there was this man of light that's been talking yeah. to um, Franklin. Franklin. Uh, yeah, Franklin, yeah. Brain fart. Um, and you had mentioned that it might be uh, Da Vinci. Michelangelo. Or Michelangelo. Well, Michael, I, I thought Michael. it was Michelangelo, but yeah, yeah, you're talking about the Vitruvian Man here. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that seems to be, yeah, because that seems to be a link here, I mean, in this childlike drawing. I mean, even though they are completely different people, they do come from the same era, and they are both stars of S.H.I.E.L.D., and he is a glowing yellow figure in this in this child's illustration. Well, I so. was more, I wasn't more saying they were saying, I was more saying... That again, it links those. It's another link this between this to Shield, and mm. I'm I'm thinking it strengthens that possibility that that you're right that that is uh, what the link Could is. Be. So so be. anyway, it's interesting. Still not sure really whether we're going to see that be part of this long game story that has been running since the start, or if that's really going to be the analogy I've been using when I've been talking to people about it is that um, this story now. Um, this two-part forever in Fantastic Four and All Hope Lies in Doom here. This is basically Return of Bruce Wayne. In, in, in the grand Morrison's Batman long game analogy, this is Hickman's Return of Bruce Wayne and his final arc on Batman and Robin, two stories running side by side that will culminate in the end of all the themes that he has really put in play. And then I'm thinking like maybe this stuff that's going to happen with Franklin might be his Batman Inc. Mm -hmm. The thing that comes after the end of all the real themes that he's put in play. Yeah, because we really are... I mean, we're mm -hmm. building to that point. We're getting to what's going to be coming after that. So, um, Yeah, but I mean, you know, like I said, it's a good, it's, this is more of a piece of the puzzle than any kind of, uh, I think, massive revelation. But, yeah, uh, uh, they're just doing science. <laughs> yes! Although... <laughs> <laughs> Although the thing that they've opened that they're opening up at the end is the uh is the is that's the gateway, isn't it, to the other to yes, the multiverse? This is the gateway to take the other read back the bridge. Is that where he wants to go or is, is Yeah, he wants some... back to his that was the whole point was that they were gonna do the orchestrate the war to create Saul's anvil, whatever it was, to use something that existed on some kind of quantum curve between all four cities to well, we never got rid of the details, but presumably split the world so that they could open up a, a portal that would allow them to go back to their home dimensions. And they're going about it in a much more direct method here. Yeah. 
But there's lots of, you know, fun, uh, snippy, kiddie interactions, which is, like, uh, a lot of the fun that these kids have brought. And um, Valeria and uh, Nathaniel. Um, <laughs> it's nice to get a flashback and see some of the things that they've been talking about, because they do run around acting awfully holier than that. I know so much more, blah, blah, blah. So it's nice to see mm-hmm. where that all started. And it's nice for, for Valeria to get caught off guard, and, and, and she lectures to Nathaniel before... The, he really tells her what you know what is it you know um he tells um he tells him that he really shouldn't keep uh, dropping hints about the future and he says why is that because you could screw up everything temporal anomalies cascading events collapsing time stream you know this you're a time traveler <laughs> And then he tells her, he tells her about how he sent the future Franklin back in time. What is that, like two years ago now? Brilliant. I just love how far back it goes, you know. And she just goes, oh, sniz. <laughs> She's really caught off guard. I, ju- I just really do actually like the way that uh, Bobillo draws her as well. In this scene. There's a couple of scenes like, uh, sometimes it's the colorist and sometimes it's not where she does have really pouty lips. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, <laughs> thick, thick eyelashes. But in this scene in particular, when she's building the lightsaber, like she really looks like a child. And um, like artists have struggled with Valeria. Uh, I mean, sometimes you just whenever whenever you have to have children actually doing adult things in comic books, it, you know, your art can sometimes get away from you. I guess because um, the depth of the intellectual things that they have to be doing pull you in the wrong direction when you're trying to do body language or facial expressions or whatever and yeah yeah but um the the simple teeny tininess of her when she's she's sitting in a little chair to make this lab and she has to pull her feet up under her and sit up with her knees up on the chair so she can reach the table you know and she she throws her arms wide as she lectures nathaniel and you know her her head is as wide as her torso you know <laughs> mm-hmm. her proport i just i just really like the way she looked in that scene yeah, I mean, and that's why I say I think the art style lends into that. I keep coming that. back to the art, yeah. <laughs> With this being the kid's story. Um, I mean, do we know, is this going to, I mean, are they talking about keeping like a separate, like FF Yeah, story the plan going? is that this is going to um, going to be, after after everything wraps up, that it's really going to be about exploring the other corners of the Fantastic Four universe that he hasn't really played in too thoroughly yet. Offhand, I don't know what's left, because really when you step back and look at the scope of everything Hickman's done, um, short of scrolls, because Secret Invasion happened. <laughs> um, uh, short of scrolls, he has really done a sort of greatest hits for the length of his run. Uh, you know, we've had the uh, Inhumans, we've had the uh, Black Panthers popped up a little in there. We got Galactus, we got the Silver Server, we got Doctor Doom, we got the MoMA, we got the Negative Zone, we got the Kree. Um, everybody, you know, it's it's been a real series wide greatest hits. Everything that makes the Fantastic Four what they are. So, what the what, you know, Mad Thinker, Doctor Doom, no, yeah. Doctor, Mad Thinker, Diablo, um, Wizard. Um, I think short of maybe. The Puppet Master, who I would love to see him do a take on. I would love to see Hickman's take on the Puppet Master. And he is like maybe the one memorable um, Fantastic Four body who hasn't been in his run yet. Um, so, yeah, get on that. I would be I would be up for that uh, yeah. following on from whatever happens here at the end. Or maybe, like I said, if the next arc goes into stuff with S.H.I.E.L.D., we may see you know an all-new connection with that or, or something mm, else. There's the possibility so. there. I don't know if he wants to go too far with it or not, because, I mean, we really don't know what's going to happen with S.H.I.E.L.D. yet. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to be renewed for uh, anything else, uh, what with the new hard-nosed st- stance on sales. But yeah. it very much feels like it's wrapping up. The, its story is ending with its second volume anyway. It feels like it's moving into a conclusion phase now. Um, it's been ages since the last issue of that. I think we're due another issue of that this month. Yeah, and the, the connections between it and Secret Warriors never got too thick. Just like just enough to say these exist. Here we are, and yeah, we'll see if it factors into closely. I mean, my, my Michelangelo hypothesis might just be completely off the wall. Might be wrong. Yeah, we'll see. So I don't know. I'm excited. I'm interested, and especially with Fantastic Four. So we've got, and we had teases in the end for uh, Fantastic Four six zero one. Mm-hmm. The end of December and FF thirteen. Does it look like it? Does it look like it's a good one? Six oh one. 
Well, I mean, it's Little got cheese. it's got the thing on it, so I mean, yeah. I don't know what else you want. I mean, that's pretty much. <laughs> you know, that's sold. That's, that's sold. it. It's like a license to print money. There you go. So awesome. So there you go. That's it. That's this week. Five week month. Man, I hate these. It's just. <laughs> Ruling. Well, the thing is, there there was no new movies that came out this week. There was hardly any nope. new comics that came out this week. It's just like this would have been a perfect week for someone to introduce something, you know, big. But yeah. no, nope. everyone went on vacation. Yeah, well, <laughs> and it's getting into the holidays, and you know, yeah. people busy with stuff, I guess. But anyway, but we're so, here. Yeah, we're we'll still bring you Fun Boy Versus. Yeah, that's right. Every- Every Maybe. week, except for on, most weeks, except for on Christmas Day. I don't know. Are we still doing it on Christmas? Day? Oh yeah, that's Ooh. on Christmas Day, Ooh. isn't it? Yes. Oh, maybe, maybe we'll have to do a Boxing Day show or Ooh. something. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> then we'll it's, talk then about it's New Year's Day the next week. As yeah. Well. Ooh. <laughs> might be a might be a little gap. That'll give us time to think up uh, our answers for a best of 2011. I know. Show. Yeah, we do so have a best of, of 2011. January. You guys yeah. already know my answer. So yeah. I reviewed it there's a, there was a lot of good stuff this year. That's that's actually going to be really interesting. So and then we're coming up on our second birthday. Yeah, I know. I mean, we've got my first anniversary. We're we're we're, we're closing in on our hundredth episode. Not too long. This, what is this this week? Uh, this is eighty two. So I mean, it's going to be another. Well, I guess it'll be yeah, yeah three or four, four, four or five months. Yeah, it'll yeah, be, be like another couple in months. March. So yeah. So <clears throat> celebrate on St. Patrick's Day. We're so, have a busy first quarter. We have. Yeah. A, we want to mention it looks like we have a bunch of Justin TV followers that showed up. So, um, oh, welcome nice. to all of you. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll mention again, as I like to do, that we do this show live every week, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, uh, 9 p.m. GMT time. Uh, so join us live at uh, tfradio.net slash live. Uh, again, that's the website as well, tfradio.net or fanboyversus.com. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at fanboyvs. We usually tweet about what we're talking about on the show, what's coming up. I, 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 I failed today. I think I think Chris <laughs> may have done a few things. So Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, but we... Uh, what did I do? Did you, you you tweeted at least from your Twitter? Oh yeah, I did a couple of things there. Some things. I, don't I did a couple, but not a whole lot. Our Twitter, yeah. So um, for regular uh, TF Radio news, I will mention that we are sorry that we didn't do a show this week. Um, life happened. Shock. So How did that happen? I it was so weird. It was just one of those things where it's like last minute. It's just like you didn't have a few me of us. Handy. I know we didn't have you handy. Uh, no one was handy <laughs> to do the recording for the show. Chris McFeely is the glue that binds us. Yes. <laughs> is, except when I have to work the next except day. Except when he's got to like, you know, hot comics the next day and can't be there. So, so anyway, um, so that's it. That's the show again. Uh, thanks so much for joining us again. It's nice to see some Justin TV chat. Yeah, there. That's usually shout out to the Justin TV guys. Yeah. That never normally happens. Please. Hope you guys come back in the future. Definitely. I don't know. Let us know how you heard about the show or, or whatever. Yeah. If you've just stumbled into it, do let us know because it's nice to see we're getting more people listening in. Yeah, I like having new people from you know, and yes. especially from Justin. It's so exciting. So, um, and again, go to the website uh, fanboyversus dot com. Um, you've got a whole archive there of episodes going back. Uh, you know, eighty one. So uh, I know someone asked about uh, Avengers. We've talked about Avengers on this show, so there's an archive mm-hmm. show for that. Search that. Um, and we're, we're again, we're going to be talking about that a lot as we get closer. And when it comes back up, when yep. the new TV show comes back yeah, up. Yeah, we don't oh. always talk comics. You know, we do yep. reviews of uh, new TV shows and films and direct Movies. to DVD things and things like that. So we do try to broaden it out sometimes. Yeah, when there's and stuff we do. About. So. You could be guaranteed as soon as Avengers movie comes out, we'll probably talk a whole hour about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that'll be a show. <laughs> Heck, yes. We got to do a commentary of that. You know, TF Radio, they do the Transformers commentaries. We should do some comic movie yeah. commentaries. Thor, Cap- Captain oh, America finally coming out uh, tomorrow on DVD Ooh. over here. We should long do enough. that. Oh, it's, like, it's been out for a while here. We should do that. Some yeah, extra but I'm content. putting it on my Christmas list. Like, <laughs> ah. I think. I think we should do a, a commentary on Green Lantern. Ooh. You're only uh, saying that because of some of the chat that's going on on Twitter tonight. Uh, I ooh. like Green Lantern, and I'm finally found someone else that likes it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't what, think... What, one person? You. 
You found two, one, actually. two people, <laughs> two people yes. like that movie besides you. That makes total three. Wow. Let's to, to see it. Uh, someone in Justin TV said they liked it, so there you go. So, oh, four, number four. So four, there's there four people. Um, so See, that's why we shouldn't do a commentary because we're just gonna get hit mail. I know. We're just, we'll get <gasps> Even though like... all the money and all the reviews actually support our belief, that's just gonna be. <laughs> I like it. JD, you did see it, right? You yes, the... I finally yes, that's saw. That's right, you did. Yeah, yes. I forgot. You remember? <laughs> I finally, I've seen everything now. I saw Captain America. I saw. Yay! Yay! When did you so... see Cap? Uh, a couple weeks ago. It was good. Yeah. It was very good. I actually, I really liked Captain America. I thought, I thought they did a great job of. Um, you know, sort of bridging that gap between the golden uh, age, you know, sort of vision of Cap, and then slowly bringing that up to what would be considered a modern Captain America, even though the story was set in World War II. So I thought it was really interesting to see him, like, kind of run the gamut all the way, even though it was still in the past. So yeah. anyway, As excited as I was for Thor, and as um, much as I love Thor, and as much as it just, like, the Avengers hype, definitely, you know, just, get me really excited for Thor and Cap thus far uh, in retrospect I'll have to rewatch Cap when I get it on DVD but looking back on him I think X-Men First Class is taking it for the year yeah I mean that's just yeah we'll yeah, have to I talk that'll have to be a subcategory for our year in review is the yeah, comic so I'm, well yeah. Um, but yeah I think that's a, definitely a strong contender is going to be First Class I've watched that several times and it just does not get boring to me I just I find new stuff when I watch it. I really enjoy it. So, I've only watched it the one time since I got it on DVD. But I was looking at it today, and I was like, "Oh, rewatch this." Let's do that. Yeah, I'll make. I, I'll come up with a fun. list, and we'll maybe we'll put it out there for the listeners as well. Yeah, I mean, you get you some input vote. from the listeners on their best of 2011s mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, for TF you know, Radio, overall net, graphic, on it. you know, art, story, all that. So anyway, we're gonna get out of here though. So um, hey, again. Uh, check us out. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to Justin again. And uh, please tune in next time when it'll be Fanboy versus. This has been Fanboy versus. Visit us at tfradio.net for show notes and to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Twitter at TF Radio for news and updates. Like the podcast? Leave us feedback on iTunes. Copyright 2011, Radio Free Cybertron.